Today we're going to be walking through the Risk Management Accelerator. The goal of this accelerator is to help find fraudulent credit card transactions. To begin, we're going to start out with visualizing and understanding our data with some exploratory data analysis. Then we're going to create two machine learning models. One, a supervised machine learning model, uh, tracking whether things look like past fraud, and an unsupervised learning model that's going to be tracking how odd a transaction might be. Uh, and then we're going to take those models and run them on batch at rest data and also deploy these models to real-time event streams so you can get the fastest, quickest results when trying to understand whether a credit card transaction was fraud or not. Um, so to begin, uh, we're going to start off in Spotfire and do some visualizing of our data. So this is the data set here. Um, as I said, it's credit card transaction data. We have around 60,000 records with around 5.9% of them being categorized as fraud. Um, now to try to understand some of the trends within our data, we can look at a couple of the categorical predictors in our data set. So we have things here that look at the type of payment method. And we can see that majority of things are labeled just as under credit card here, but there are a few of the categories that have a very high uh, pr uh, proportion of fraud. Um, and then in addition, if I look at the products here, uh, we can see that uh, the majority are not fraud in a couple of these products, but in one product right here, we see that there is a very high proportion of fraud. Um, in addition to this, we can also look at some numerical predictors. Here we're looking at the age of the account and um, in this case, we see that uh, one indicating fraud, that the age of the account on the box plot here is centered much lower, indicating that uh, less mature accounts might be more susceptible to fraud. Um, the next thing that we could try to look at here is um, do an analysis of uh, correlation between predictors. And why we might want to do this is if there might be some correlated predictors, we can maybe only use one of them or figure out if we want to ignore anything. Everything looks pretty good for now. And then we can move on to uh, some predictor importance. So this is actually taking the correlation between uh, all of our predictors and the target variable of being fraud or not. And we can see that these would be the initial things that we might end up seeing as the most important variables for our models. Um, so now I'm actually going to move on to the model building. And to begin, we're going to start with a supervised machine learning model. So what this is doing is it's taking all of our historical data, it's training a model to recognize what it might indicate fraud and not fraud, and we then are going to have a model that's ready to score new data. So the results of the model are as follows. We get this variable importance ranking that's developed from the model that's showing how much influence a certain variable had on the model. So if I were to click on one of these here, we'll see this partial dependence plot being shown. And what this is showing is that when this uh, variable was set to zero, the average score uh, was very much not likely to be fraud. But when it came to uh, whenever it was above zero, we see that the average measurement value for whether it was fraud is actually um, higher. So or it's lower here, mean that uh, it has a higher potential of being fraud. Um, and then we can look at some other uh, variables here. We can look at a risk provider, and uh, this is basically measuring the risk of the certain provider of the credit card. And we see that when this is negative, uh, it's uh, higher, and then when it's positive, it has a lower risk. So um, now we can move on to some of metrics to uh, analyze our model. So we can look at some typical ways of analyzing, like things like an ROC curve. We can see that uh, for the best type of model, it sticks right along this, this green line, and you can barely see the green line, so that's good. It's uh, got a very good ROC curve. Um, in addition to this, we have this optimal threshold right here, and this is basically asking what the best probability threshold is for this model that will um, help get the best accuracy measures. And this is actually something we're going to look at on the next page as well. So now that we have our supervised model, we can actually adjust it specifically for our business needs. So there's something that we can analyze as cost here. 
So let's say that um, the cost of having a false negative is much higher than the cost of a false positive because if you were to miss when fraud happened, let's say that's more expensive than whether you just uh, checked it instead. So um, you can actually adjust this so that if you know that the false negative is five times uh, more costly than the false positive, you can adjust it and the threshold for your model uh, will change. Um, and here we can see the amount of cases that would end up being having to be analyzed by your team. But we can also look at the opposite case. If we now look at the cost of the false positive being five times more costly as the false negative, we can adjust it for that way as well. And this might be the case where uh, you have fewer people on your team to investigate these transactions and you only want to be notified of when something is very likely to be fraud. And you'll see that in this case, uh, there's a, a much higher um, threshold or much higher proportion of fraud in these cases. So uh, if I'm satisfied with this, I can uh, use that 0.81 cutoff as it is marked here and I can improve the model for deployment. So that is our supervised machine learning model. Now I can move on to our unsupervised learning. So for this, what we're using is something called principal component analysis. And what this does is it takes all around, I think there are 60 columns in our data set, and it retains the, the 60 variables of information in a smaller number of variables. So rather than 60, we can reduce it to maybe only 10 principal components that captures all of our information. And what we're looking at here is uh, comparing the first component to the second component to the third component. And for our risk measurement, uh, whether something might be fraud or not, uh, we're asking how far away is one, are one of these transactions from this big cluster of what is likely normal transactions because uh, these have been seen before and they're numerically not much different than one another. But we kind of expect when things start to get end up kind of on their own island and further away from the cluster, uh, they might be more odd and then maybe more susceptible to fraud. So if I now move on to the next page here, uh, we can use this elbow plot here to actually help us figure out what the right number of components is to keep. So as I said, there's around 60 variables in our data set, um, but each of these principal components is ordered by the percent of variance that it captures. So the first one is most important, the second one is next, and so on. And we'll see that uh, there's a point of inflection right here that looks to be where uh, it's not worth it to keep on adding more and more numbers of components. Instead, it looks like uh, you get diminishing returns. So 10 looks to maybe be our best number of factors to consider here. So if I leave it as 10 and I can calculate the oddity scores for uh, this data. And the oddity scores are basically things that are captured by the red here. So we'll see that the red is furthest away from this big cluster that we might see here. Um, but the red is also done on uh, all 10 components. So you, we're trying to visualize this with just uh, only three uh, axes here and only two axes and some of these other ones, uh, but in actuality it's using all 10. So I calculate the audio scores and similarly to the unsuper or to the supervised model, um, I can uh, use a threshold for our data set. So let's say that I only want things that are extremely odd to for me to actually get notified about them. So if I raise this up to uh, 50, we see that there's, okay, I guess maybe I can put it lower than something like 50. If I lower it now to 36, maybe we can see that uh, 0.23 of transaction percent of transactions actually get flagged. So these are very, very unusual transactions and there's not actually that many of them. Um, and we could use this as another way to help flag a potential fraud. So um, now that I have that model, I can approve it for deployment and I can take these models and actually now run them to uh, at rest data. So I'm gonna start out by doing that. I'm going to run this on a batch of data. And something that I can actually adjust here is, uh, like I said, an analyzing the business scenarios. So um, you can actually adjust this for how many minutes on average does it take for uh, someone to complete an investigation. If it takes them a longer amount of time, maybe closer to an hour, you can adjust it and you'll see that the team days required 
is uh, is also moved. And I can also adjust this. Maybe we have lost some people on our team and we only have 15 people to go through this. And you'll see that there's 24 days required. So that can help us determine what we want our thresholds to be and how many, uh, how many uh, claims we actually want to investigate here. So here we have this uh, quadrant plot that's showing uh, things that end up looking like our target. So these are things that were flagged by uh, the supervised model. So they had the score above that 0.81 threshold that we had set. Um, we'll see there's a lot of transactions falling in here. Um, and then these on the top right are things that ended up being flagged by both of our models. And then here, just on the right, these are the things that uh, ended up just being categorized as odd. So um, we can adjust this as we need, but I can now just run this on the whole batch of data and we can see what the scores end up being. Now we have our models, we can actually now send those models to TIPCO Streaming. So if I go ahead and click on both of these buttons here, um, I've approved the models and I'm actually sending them um, to TIPCO Streaming. And first I'm actually going to look at an artifact management server and I'm going to go through and actually approve those models. So we can think about this as a collaborative way to uh, first actually send out the models, maybe a developer be doing that, and then an admin comes through and actually approves those models. Um, so now I can take those approved models and I can deploy them right here. So I can click deploy. This will deploy them and send them out to TIPCO Streaming and deploy here for our unsupervised model. And now if I open up TIPCO Streaming, I can actually run this on the real time data. So I'm going to reduce, resume my stream here. And if I go into Spotfire again, I can now open up this real time dashboard and I can view as transactions are coming in in real time. So we'll see that uh, our threshold has changed. So we had models deployed before, but now we've raised those thresholds and we can see that a few of them actually have gone over our threshold and have alerted us, um, but nothing has come in for the oddity score here. Um, and we could see also how they are coming in one by one. Um, in addition to this, we can also use uh, uh, Spotfire as a case management tool. So I have all of these transactions here and they've come in and they're pending for now because no one has investigated them. But I could click on one of these here, I could assign it to myself, and then I could actually do a deeper dive to see if they were actually fraud or not. And then finally, something that we can look at is our models and our model deployments. So we see that we had a different version of the model before. Now we have deployed our newest version of the model. This can be something that we constantly adjust for our, our changing business needs. Um, but we can also see things like the latency, how long it took for the models to actually go through score and also have it sent out to Spotfire. Mm -hmm.